taught by JT. These lights are bright. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is John Tate, and I make the iOS app at Glowforge. Uh, the primary purpose of the app is to allow users to send prints to their 3D laser printer um, and for the printer to send data back to the user. Uh, in Swift, we normally ma manage this data using types, but as you can imagine, as the number of types that your system needs to operate increases, there's often a linear expansion in the, in the, in the number of operations and processes to deal with those types. Today, I'd like to talk to you about how I use generics to handle type expansion in a recent project at Glowforge. Oftentimes, when you have a list of specific programs, if you remove the differences that lead to these, pro that le lead to these um, specific programs, you could end up with a single unified program. And then, instantiating this unified program with different parameters causes the program to specialize itself and be expressed differently. This is the heart of generics. The goal of generics is to increase the possibilities of parameterization uh, into, the type, into the type system. Shown here is the syntax for generics. Attribute inside the angle brackets is a generic type. What this means is that the attribute field below can be filled with whatever type, with whatever type you desire. There are different types of generics, um, but today I'd like to talk to you about three, value, function, and type. Uh, and we'll start with generics by value, uh, since it's the most common. Early on in our careers, we learned to parameterize functions as we grappled with the futility of hard coding values into our program. Say you needed to draw a triangle as shown here. You may start with something like this. The drawing behavior is primarily driven by the vertical height of the triangle, so you could print each row until you get your desired height. But what happens when you need a triangle of height, say, 10,000? Or what happens if you just need a, tri a triangle of height, say, 7, but you need a triangle to be, driven, to be drawn with, say, kissing heart emojis? The benefits of abstracting the drawing behavior into parameters becomes immediately obvious. You pass in your desired height and the character that you'd like to use to draw your triangle. You just go from one to the height, drawing each row, and when you're done, you just print that row. In the end, you get a program with formal parameters performing different but related computations based on the parameters that you pass in. This is generics by value, value being the parameters that you pass into your function. Next, let's talk about one of my favorite types of generics, generics by function. Say you had a list of strings that you wanted to transform to, their lower, to, to lowercase. You may write something like this. You start with an empty list, and you loop through the elements that were provided, transforming each to lowercase, and appending the result to the empty list you started with. And when you're done, you return the transformed element. And say you need to transform a list of numbers to their even odd Boolean representation. You may write something like this. Again, you start with an empty list, you loop through the elements provided, transforming each element to their even odd Boolean representation and appending that to the list. And when you're done, you just return the list of transformed elements. The only difference between those two operations, between those two functions, is the operation being used to transform each element. Lowercase for the first, and the condition of being even odd for the second. What's common is traversing a list and transforming each element, and when you're done, Returning the list of transforming, returning the list of transformed elements. This is called a map, the same map that some of you might be familiar with. 
Here is one implementation of map as an extension on an array. And this is essentially identical to our, previ our two previous definitions. Start with an empty list. You loop through the elements provided, transforming each. And when you're done, you return a list of transformed elements. The difference is that the transform operation is parameterized and fully customizable. Here is how you could get the result of the former two implementations using the single map function we just defined. Map is more flexible and safer, and behold, it's elegant. It is important to note that this isn't just genericity by value, where the value is simply a function that you pass in. The implications here are far-reaching, providing incredible, incredibly powerful customization points for engineers without extending the language. Let's move on to generics by type by looking at, st at stacks. A stack is a common data structure that can be backed by a list and have two important operations. Push, that adds an element to the end of the list, and pop, that returns the last element was added, that was added. Say you wanted to create a stack of emojis. You may write something like this. You start with an empty list, and you add your push and your pop function. Then you just instantiate the stack and push your emoji onto it. And then, say you need a stack of ints. You just instantiate the stack and try to push an int onto it. Shade from the compiler. Let me translate the shade for you. You created a stack, you hard-coded character type into it, and then you try to push an int onto it. What did you think was going to happen? So here we go again, redefining stack but this time for ints. Not only, is it on, uh, not only is it tedious to repeat de similar definitions like this, it is unsafe and very difficult to maintain. The definition of the backing list is essentially the same, and so are the definitions for our push and pop function. We can do better. Abstracting away the two hard-coded types, character and int, leads to the creation of a single unifying polymorphic type element. At work here is the idea that the instantiated behavior is independent of the type passed in. We just need to be able to add and remove elements. Now, you could create a stack of any arbitrary type without tediously repeating definitions, and you get no shade from the compiler. All right, let's move on to talking about Jason Parson. You might be familiar with, with Jason. Here is a blob of Jason, of a, Jason, a Jason blob representing a person. Modeling this is more or less straightforward and might look like this. If you're unfamiliar with Codable, it's just a convenient way of converting between JSON data and, our, and your local models. If your JSON data is heterogeneous, it can be very difficult to parse, but the process can be made more pleasant by using generics. Here we have a data tag that can represent an actual resource or a resource identifier. The idea is that if you get a resource identifier, you could create an API request and use that to make a network call to get the actual resource that was identified. The meta tag, as in information uh, that, that identifies the resource and tells you if it's, a resource, if it's a resource identifier or an actual resource. So at Glowforge, we have a 3D laser printer, and its prints are modeled as print activity. So we often get data about updates for the printer or ongoing prints. Say, for instance, when a print is completed. So if we model the meta tag uh, of the JSON data, we might get something like this. Also shown here is the resource type. 
and I have print activity and printer here. Just note that we, can, we have a lot more resource types to model in our data. The data portion of the JSON might look like this. We have a type and an ID and an incoming request function. Resource inside the Angular bracket is generic with an important distinction. It has codable constraints. What this means is that resource can be anything as long as that thing implements a codable protocol. And just remember that codable means if you, if you, if you implement the, protocol, the codable protocol, it just means that you can con convert between JSON data and your local model. And the incoming request function does create the API request that you're going to use to make your network call. Here is a simplified version of an API request. You have an ID and a type, and this API request represents a codable resource. And then here is the full model. We have our meta and our data and requests that simply call the incoming request on, on data. In the end, the goal is to make a network call to get the resource that was identified. Here is what your network call might look like. I trim these network functions just to focus on what's essential. Perform takes a generic API request that it can use then to, to, to make a network call. Once the data is returned from a successful call, we can then decode that data into a codable resource into a, into, a, into, a hard, into a concrete object and pass that to our completion handler. And this is where we're going to call the perform function that we just identified. This function takes the resource identifier, and from that identifier, it could get the request and pass that request to the perform function. And this is where it comes together. Socket message received is where we pass the data that we get from updates, from the printer or the printer activity. So we pass the meta object, and the data, the JSON data, represented the data tag in the JSON file. And we switch on the resource type to get, say, a printer update. Printer updates are for things like when the user opened their machine. So we could say, hey, the lid is open. And we decode the data for the packet to get a resource packet. But this resource packet represents a printer. And then we create a, a resource identifier and pass that to our update receive function. So this resource identifier comes in here as something that's generic. But once our call is successful, we get a concrete object out of it. So inside the printer portion of our, Swift, uh, of our, switch, of our switch statement here, we will get an actual printer inside here. So we can use a printer right here. This, this shows the beauty of generics when dealing with complex heterogeneous data. So what's the takeaway? Every type has a set of minimum requirements. Generics emerge out of the insight that Highly reusable components must be built with a minimum set of these requirements. But we can't fully leverage generics by just identifying a set of requirements for a single data type. We must identify a set of laws for a collection of similar types. Then we can use those laws to create a single unified program. And then instantiating that program with various parameters causes the program to specialize itself and be expressed differently. Thank you.